All right. Start if you would. Verse number 25, Acts chapter 16. The Bible says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the words of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and, and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this time that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, forgiving us of our sins, dear Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being faithful to us. I pray, Lord, you'll just touch me tonight, dear Lord. Just give me the power from on high. I pray you'll touch this message for your honor and your, your glory, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that uh, for all the people who come here tonight, that none of us will leave um, empty, dear Lord, that we'll leave filled tonight, dear Lord. You'll just touch us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my message tonight is The Three Prisoners at Philippi. The Three Prisoners at Philippi. Now, we all know this story, and there's two prisoners we know for sure who they are. We know one is Paul, we know the other one is Silas. But who's the third one? Well, the third one is the other man in this story, the Philippian jailer. Now what makes him a prisoner in this, in this passage? Well, Paul and Silas were physical prisoners. They were bound physically. They were thrown into prison behind bars and watched physically. But this man at Philippi, this Philippian jailer, he was prisoned, he was under shackles, he was chained spiritually. He might have been free physically, but spiritually he was a prisoner. I uh, went over to a, a correctional institute, like a prison. It was maybe two years ago, about a year and a half ago. Anyhow, those men that I preached to, a lot of them that come in there, there was only about the number that's here tonight, there was only a few of them, but I believe all of them pretty much were saved. A lot of them who come there were believers who had accepted Christ maybe before or even after. But anyhow, preaching to those men, physically, they were at a prison. They were at a jail. Physically, they were prisoners. But spiritually, those who were saved had been set free. They were no longer prisoners. And I preached to those men in a prison, and I preached to some people, other places, who are physically free, who are just free to do whatever they want, but spiritually they're prisoners. And that's what this man here was, this Philippian jailer. He was a prisoner. Paul and Silas, they were behind bars, I'm sure, or whatever that kind of uh, prison that was. But spiritually, they were set free. Let's look at, uh, by way of introduction, what's going on here. This is the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. Now, go back up to chapter 15. Look if you would, look if you would in uh, verse number 36 through 41. By way of introduction. For verse number 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia confirming the churches. What Paul wanted to do, he wanted to take Barnabas 
back around to the churches that they had started in the first missionary journey and confirm those churches. He wanted to make sure that they were growing in the grace and the truth of the gospel. We need that today. We need good discipleship today. We have a lot of outreach today, but we need to focus a lot on discipling our Christians, discipling our members. When someone gets saved in the church, we need to take them as a newborn babe and we need to watch them grow and we need to give them the proper nourishment of the Word and we need to watch them mature and help them grow as a Christian. That's what Paul was doing. He had started those churches and he wanted to make sure that they were going to stay true to what he preached. And those new, I'm sure he had new converts. I'm sure he had um, maybe a few called, on, you know, called to preach under him. And he just wanted to go back and make sure that they were just staying true to the Word of God. So he talks to Barnabas. Barnabas wants to take John Mark. We all know the story there. John Mark didn't go with him. So Paul and Silas, we see, or excuse me, Paul and Barnabas, first of all, there was plans to revisit the churches. Then they, he parts away with Barnabas. But then he picks Silas in verse 40 and 41. Silas was recommended by the brethren. Now I want you to look at something real quick. In chapter 16, Paul finds Timothy. So to start out, Paul has Barnabas. They... They go their separate ways. So Paul is recommended by the brethren to take Silas. So he grabs Silas, and then all of a sudden, when they go to Derby and Lystra, they find Timothy. And once they find Timothy, look if you want in verse number, verse number 8. The Bible says, And they, passing to Mesha, came down to Troas. It says, And they. Look if you want in verse number 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we. We all know the writer of the book of Acts is Luke, Dr. Luke. So not only does Paul have Silas, not only does he have Timothy, but now he has Luke. Can you just imagine what a prayer meeting would be like around Paul and Timothy and Silas and Luke? I preached a message one time, maybe a year or so ago, I can't really remember. But the title of the message was Surrounding Yourself Around the Right People. Paul had surrounded himself around the right men to get the job done that the Lord had wanted him to do. He was around men who loved the Lord and they were set out. God had gave them this journey to go on and they were set out to, to lead souls to Christ and preach the gospel. And he was around the right men to do the job. Paul's going on his second missionary journey here and he goes to Philippi in verse 12 and 13. In verse 14 and 15 he leads... Lydia to the Lord. There's a woman named Lydia that he uh, this is the first convert in Europe. And then it says here in verse 16 through 24, there is a girl who's possessed of a demon, and her she's a slave girl, and her masters are using her to make money. So Paul sees it, and he's seen about enough of it. He goes and he casts those demons out of her. That's the authority he had as an as an apostle. So when he cast those demons out of her, her masters realize that their prophet is gone. So they take Paul and Silas before all the, the leaders there, the, the Roman leaders, and they say, these men are teaching Jewish customs that aren't right to Roman law. So they beat them up and they cast them in jail. That's how Paul and Silas ended up in this prison here. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see, Paul and Silas, they were preaching the word of the Lord. They were preaching the gospel. They had cast the demons out of that young girl. And what happened? They were beaten for that. They were whipped for that. They were thrown into jail for that. Those men didn't care about that girl. See, the world doesn't care about us. A lot of the world don't even care about each other. But what they did was they took Paul and Silas and they threw them into prison for that. And they became the physical prisoners. Number one, we see the physical prisoners here. We see Paul and Silas. They were the physical prisoners in these verses. Look if you would verse number 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into, the, into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. These men that had that young girl and they cast those demons out, Paul and Paul did, and then they took Paul and Silas and they beat them. Well, they cast them into prison. Paul and Silas, they were held under captivity. 
when you stand on the gospel, you're, you may be physically harmed. You may even be, you know, verbally harmed. We're probably not as much physically harmed as they were back then, but there's going to be harm against us if we stand for the gospel. Amen? You know, if everybody you know gets along with you and um, likes you and thinks you're alright, then there might be something wrong there. When you stand for something and you stand firm on something, somebody somewhere isn't going to like that. And they took Paul and Silas and they threw them in there. We see their captivity. Then we see their choice in verse number 25. Their choice. They were living right. They were doing what they were supposed to do. And what did they get for it? What did they get in return? Well, they got beat up and thrown in prison. They had three, pretty much three choices they could go through here. They could either, one, they could whine about it. Two, they could give up. Or three, look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. If you don't get anything else I say tonight, I want you to look in verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. They had been beat up. They had been cast into prison for the Lord's sake. What did they do? They glorified them. They praised them. And look at verse number 25, the last part. And the prisoners heard them. You see, our lost loved ones in the lost community, they hear us praise the Lord when we're on the mountaintop, don't they? Amen. When we're on the mountaintop and things are going our way and everything's going our direction and we're just praising the Lord and we're good financially and we're, we're good in this area and we're good at work and we're good in all these different areas, and we're just praising the Lord everywhere that we go, they hear us, don't they? But when we're over here in the valley, the, the decisions we make are very critical. Because if we continue to praise the Lord, if we continue to glorify the Lord, that's an even better testimony to them. See, these prisoners probably saw Paul and Silas, how they'd been beaten. They saw how they'd been thrown into prison. And then at midnight, they began to sing praises to the Lord. See, that's a good testimony. The decisions we make when we're on the mountaintop to glorify the Lord, that's good. Of course, always glorify the Lord. Amen? But we also want to glorify the Lord when we're in the valley, when things aren't going our way. And Paul and Silas have been beaten up and thrown into prison, but they were happy because it was for the Lord's sake. Amen? Amen. We see here their choices. Matthew chapter 5. Keep your spot in Acts. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know, if we're getting persecuted... If we're going through trials and tribulations, and if we're getting persecuted by others, verbally, physically, whatever it is, and all those lies are being spread about us, if it's for the Lord's sake, then it's a good thing. Amen? You know, I've always thought, people are going to talk bad about you anyway, so you might as well be doing right while they do it. Amen? You might as well be reading your Bible, praying for them, going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Sunday school, being faithful keeping the Lord first. They're going to talk bad about you anyway. You know, so Paul and Silas here in verse 25 it says, and the prisoners heard them. That was a choice they had made. Jesus said over in, um, in Matthew chapter uh, 10 verse 22, said that hate will be hated for His name's sake. They hated Paul and Silas not because they were Jewish but because they preached the gospel. Because who they stood for. We see the choice they made. Then we see the change that took place. The change that took place. Look at verse number 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. 
The direct interpretation of this verse is that Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. They began to sing praises at midnight and then that earthquake. Suddenly that earthquake came. We can apply this to us in verse number 24, verse number 23, they're, getting, they're going through persecution. In verse number 25, they're in captivity. And in verse number 26, they're already delivered. You see, persecution for the Christian is only temporary. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what it is. The Bible says over in Romans chapter 8, I believe, verse number 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time shall not be worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Look if you would in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 8 through 11. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 8 through 11. Persecution for the Christian is only temporary. It's, all, it's not going to last forever. Look at start with verse number 8. It says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of, uh, the, dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul and Silas had been persecuted. They had been cast down. They had been whipped. They had been beaten up. But they weren't defeated. You see, there was a change. Persecution for the Christian is only temporary. We might be physical, uh, physically captive on this world, but spiritually we're free. Amen? Amen? We see, number one, the physical prisoners. Number two, the spiritual prisoner. Look, if you would, in verse number 24. Paul and Silas were the physical prisoners. And then we see the spiritual prisoner. Look at verse number 24. Bible says, who having received such a charge, that's the Philippian jailer, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. See, Paul and Silas had been, they'd been confined to that prison. They had been shackled, I'm sure. But they weren't the ones who were really shackled, were they? It was that Philippian jailer. He was the one who'd been shackled. He was the one who'd been confined. He was the one who was in captivity. See, he was the prisoner. We see, first of all, we're going to use the same points here, but the spiritual prisoner, we see his captivity. In verse 24, we see he has his shackles. What are the, prison, what are the sinner shackles? Think of the sinner. The sinner may be physically free, but he's not spiritually free. What is the, the sinner's shackles? First of all, I have three things written down here that a prisoner, uh, a sinner, might prevent them from being free. I have three things that might prevent a sinner from being free. Number one is pride. See, that gets in the way with a lot of lost people today is their pride. They're too proud to go to church. They're too proud to listen to the preacher. They're too proud to listen, listen to the missionary. Too proud to go to Sunday school. Too proud to read a Bible tract. They're proud. It's pride. Another thing is pleasure. The sinner can't get enough pleasure, can they? You know, that um, old rock singer um, wrote that song, Can't Get No Satisfaction, had all that money, anything he wanted, but he can't get satisfied. You know why? Because he hasn't been set free yet. He hasn't been unshackled. He hasn't found the truth. He hasn't found the real meaning of life. Amen? He hasn't found the Lord. Like Paul and Silas, here they were, probably didn't have much. They'd been beaten. They'd been cast down into prison. And here they were singing the song. They weren't trying to play mind games with anybody. They weren't trying to fool the jailer. They had joy down here. Amen? Amen. They had joy in their heart. Christians, we may not always be happy, but we always have joy. Amen? There's a difference between happiness and joy. Somebody tells you you always have to be happy. You don't always have to be happy. If something really bad happens, you can be sad. Amen? It's okay to cry. 
but you'll always have your joy. Amen? Paul and Silas probably weren't that happy at this point in time. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been uh, beat up and thrown into prison before, but I don't think I'd be too happy either. But we still have our joy. We see these sinners, they have their pride, they have their pleasure. Then they have their present. They don't look into the future. They, They live in this present time. That's all they think about. Well, I'll go to church later on, but right now I'm too busy. See, they're shackled. They're spiritually captive. We see number one, his captivity. And also, look if you would in verse number 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who had receiving such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. They charged him pretty much saying, if you don't keep these guys in here, we're pretty much we're going to kill you. That's pretty much why, I mean, that's kind of how, how that whole thing worked out there. Okay? And he probably thought his physical life's in danger. But really, what he should have been worried about was his spiritual life. His spiritual life was in danger. And we're going to get back into that in a little bit. But we see here, his shackles, and then he had... Not only did he have his shackles, but he had his shame. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7. The spiritual prisoner. Not only do they have shackles tonight, but they also have their shame. Genesis chapter 3, look if you will in verse number 7. Start verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This is Adam and Eve. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves apron. Not only does the spiritual prisoner, the sinner, have shackles, but they have shame. You see, the blood of Christ covers all the believer's sins. All, the, all those that have trusted in Christ, he is, a, he is a propitiation for our sins. If you have trusted in Him tonight, you've repented of your sins. That word repent means to turn away. And you trust in Christ and you constantly you live, try to live a clean life and try to keep your life clean. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And He's convicting us of our sins. And we're always in a constant state of repentance. Well, our sins are... When God sees us, our sins are covered. Amen? If you're saved tonight, the moment you're saved, from there on out, your sins are covered. You're going to heaven no matter what. But you see, sinners here, like Adam and Eve, their eyes were opened and they realized their shame. They realized they were naked and they they were ashamed of that. This prisoner here, in verse number 29, says he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He realized he was a sinner. In order for those sinners to be saved, they need to realize their shame. They need to be ashamed of their sins. They need to be sorry for their sins. We see their shackles, we see their shame, and then we see their sentence. You know, there's only one way to heaven. You know, if this, if this man, in verse number... 27, and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew, drew out his sword and would have killed himself. If he would have done that, Paul wouldn't have stopped him. He would have died and went to hell. See, these spiritual prisoners, these sinners, these, the lost people, this lost and dying world, they have a sentence. And if they don't get the free pardon of sin, if they don't get on that free pardon, they're going to go to hell. The Bible says... For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. We see here their their sentence. And then last of all, two more points. We see his choice. Verse number 26, there's an earthquake. Verse number 27, he realizes they're all gone. Verse number 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He had a choice. 
Number one, His choice affected Him. Our choices are always going to affect certain people. And first and foremost, your choices are going to affect you. But not only your choices are going to affect you, look if you would in verse number 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Not only does your choices affect you, but your choices also affect your family, your children, maybe your brother, your sister, your mother, your father. We can apply this to us as believers. Not only should we live right because it's commanded of us that we want to have fellowship with the Lord, but also everything we do not only affects us and our relationship with Him, but it also affects those that are watching us. Maybe our children. Maybe our mother, our lost mother and our lost father. Maybe our lost brother, our lost sister. Amen. And I heard a preacher say one time, he had his son there. We were at the Bible Institute. He said, you know, if I don't like the preacher, then my son doesn't have to like the preacher. He don't know why he doesn't like the preacher. He just knows he doesn't have to like him because daddy doesn't like him. Does that make sense? Every choice we make, it affects somebody else. And this man here, he decided, he made the decision, I want to accept Christ as my personal Savior. He went up to Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not only was he saved that night, but that decision affected his whole family. Paul and Silas went back to his house and they led his whole family to the Lord. Ain't that a blessing? See, he made a choice. His choice affected his whole family. Then last of all, there was a change. There was a change in this uh, spiritually uh, imprisoned man. Turn, if you would, to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Real fast. I'll read this verse real quick. And we'll close here in a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. He said over here in uh, verse number 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See, this man, he was in captivity. Then he made a choice. And then he was changed. See, he was a new creature now. He'd been reborn. We see here he had a he had a choice. He had a change. He'd been pardoned. He found peace, and he had a promise. Those of us who are saved, we've been pardoned. We have peace, and we have a promise. The Bible says over in Ephesians chapter two. I'll read the verse real quick. In verse number fourteen, the Bible says. For He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's talking about Jews and Gentiles. But He's saying here, the Lord is our peace. He is our peace. The Bible says over in Philippians 4 verse 7, that it's a peace that passeth all understanding. When He had that change, when He was that new man, when God saved Him immediately, a change took place. And now all of a sudden He had that peace. He was a changed man. Not only had he been saved, but his whole family had been saved. How about that? And then we see the promise here. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, I'll close with this. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. We see his change. He had been pardoned, he had peace, and he also he had a promise. Amen? All right, if you would, uh, bow your head and close your eyes. And we'll um, say a word of, word of prayer here. But if you would, just think about those three prisoners. Just think about how Paul and Silas, how they had experienced physical and that physical abuse and how they, they had been thrown into prison, but they still had their joy. Whatever happens to us, we should continue to glorify the Lord. Continue to praise the Lord. 
When Job lost all of his children, all of his hard work, he fell down to the ground and he worshipped. When Paul and Silas had been beaten up and thrown into prison, they sang praises. God's God on the mountaintops, but He's also God in the valley.